mind. As Jacqueline mentioned, she and I produced that report in 1992, which was the first and only report that Congress has ever asked for on adaptation to climate change, 23 years ago. However, Congress did mandate updates on climate change science, and in our 2014 report, the National Climate Assessment, we managed to focus far, far more on the impacts of climate change and what we need to do to prepare. So they're getting a lot of information about adaptation. And I would just like to say, I think the issue of adaptation has been far too long in the world. We're at least 20 years behind in thinking about it. Initially, I believe people didn't want to think about adaptation because it seemed like it was instead of mitigation or reducing emissions. But now it's absolutely clear that the pace and magnitude of climate change is such that we are seeing changes today already to which we need to adapt and more are in store no matter how much we mitigate. So we really need to both mitigate and adapt. Basically, I would argue the future is in our hands and it's really a tale of these two worlds. We can leave the next generation the world on the left side of the chart, temperatures on the top and below that is precipitation. And that world's about two degrees C or almost four degrees Fahrenheit warmer on average. Or we can leave the next generation the pair of globes on the right, which I would argue is a roasted world of about four degrees Celsius or almost eight degrees Fahrenheit average warmer with the higher latitudes having warmed about twice that much. And look at the bottom, the vastly drier areas in brown and the vastly wetter areas in blue. That's almost an unrecognizable planet. We can still choose which world we want, and we should all hope for a successful climate treaty in Paris at the end of this year, and it'll keep us on the left side of the chart. So carbon dioxide is the most ubiquitous heat trapping or greenhouse gas. Um, it's rising inexorably, and as you all know, I hope, it is the result of burning carbon-based fuels. That's pretty good for carbon dioxide. That's coal, oil, gas, wood. And it hit 400 parts per million this year, up from 275, where it was in the pre-industrial era. But it is headed up to 600 or 800 parts per million on our business as usual path. You probably also just heard that the temperature in 2014 was declared the warmest year on record. 13 of the last 15 years have been the warmest on record. So recently, Seth Bornstein from the Associated Press got statisticians to calculate what was the probability of having 13 of the 15 warmest years all in the last 15, um, if it was truly random. And his answer, and you can look at his blog, was 41 trillion to one. Those are amazing odds. And even Congress uh, voted 48 hours ago, 98 to one, that climate change is real. However, the clause <laughs> Photo from 2008 is showing as the planet warms 
We're speeding up the water cycle, we're getting more rainfall and more intense rainfall. The second finding is that Americans are already seeing the effects of increases in sea level as well as extreme weather. And so if you think back to Sandy in 2012, with the one foot increase in sea level that we've already seen in New York City, the floodwaters from Sandy surged far further inward and did more damage than they would otherwise have done. Their third conclusion is that impacts are apparent in every region and in important sectors that are including health and water and agriculture and energy, etc. So it's affecting us now. They also said in our pocketbooks and on our land and in every region of the United States. It's changing the lives of farmers and mayors and foresters and engineers and town planners and doctors and patients. And their fourth method, message is there are many actions we can take to reduce future climate change and its impacts and to prepare for the impacts we can't avoid. So, mitigation and adaptation. And I think there are reasons to be hopeful. As I said, the world is committed to having a global climate treaty at the end of this year. Um, the administration has developed a climate action plan that is reducing emissions in many sectors of the economy. Uh, the president just received a report from the task force of uh, tribal, state, and um, mayoral leaders on climate preparedness and resilience. And four Midwesterners served on that. From Indiana, we had Mayor Brainerd of Carmel. From Michigan, we had Mayor Hartwell from Green Rapids. From Iowa, we had Franklin um, County, the mayor of Des Moines. In Ohio, we had Paula Brooks, the commissioner of Franklin County. And they said, all across the nation, local communities are acting to respond to changes that are observed because they know things are changing. Also, in the private sector, I think there is great promise because we are seeing many business leaders who are seeing their supply chains disrupted as the reliability, timing, and quality of, for example, water or foodstuffs are being upset. So I think there's positive signs, action at the federal level, action at the international level, action at the local level, action at the business level. Let's hope it all comes together. Uh, I'm going to spend just a few minutes on the highest level conclusions of the report um, because I think this is the simplest way to explain climate change. There are basically 10 indicators that you expect to be changing if the Earth is warming. Seven of those should be going up, and here I'm showing them as white arrows. Five of those white arrows are temperatures. There is sea surface temperature, deep water temperature, temperature of land, temperature over sea, temperature in the air. The other two going up should be sea level rise and the increase in humidity as you're speeding up the water cycle. You expect the black arrows, the decreases in the three areas, all related to snow and ice, glaciers, snow cover, and sea ice. And all 10 of these indicators are occurring today and in the direction that we expect. And I'm sure you've heard that we're losing ice in Greenland and the Arctic sea ice far faster than we expected, which is an example of a nonlinear trend that is quite worrisome. And there's quite a bit of talk about whether or not we'll have an ice-free Arctic in the summer in a few decades, not in the century. And we actually have seen vessels going through the Northeast Passage and the Northwest Passage uh, carrying things like fossil fuels or and grain, ironically. But here are the data sets behind those arrows. I just want you to know this, that each of them has multiple data sets and that they're over a long time. It's really important to have a long time series because of all the bumps and wiggles and natural variability in data. Uh, especially climate data. Some of these sets go back 150 years, and none are shorter than 50 years. So again, here are the five temperature arrows going up. Here's the sea level and humidity, and here is the snow where we expect it to be going down. So the report said that climate is changing and effects are being felt everywhere. We have independent proof of the temperature changes. Um, as I hope you know, spring is now coming one to two weeks earlier. And the evidence for this comes from roughly 75 botanical gardens around the globe and satellite measurements as well that measure greening and first leaf out after spring. But we're also seeing that the ideal range to grow crops and plants is shifting in response to changing temperatures. Here I'm mentioning that blueberries have essentially moved to Quebec. Um, we're seeing heat record highs are being broken around the globe. <coughs> And extreme heat events have doubled in the last few decades. So if you think back to 2003, 
that incredible heat wave that killed 35,000 people in Europe, and generally that's a rich part of the world, that would have been a once in a century event of an unchanged climate. But going forward, we expect it to occur more often than once every decade by 2100. Um, heat and evaporation are um, heat and evaporation are increasing drought, and especially in the interior of continents. In the United States, droughts always cost at least $5 billion a year. But we have seen incredible food crises in many parts of the world in recent years, which I think really brings home how fragile our food distribution systems are. And pests. Warmer weather weather is helping all sorts of pesky invasives, ranging from um, mosquitoes to um, ants to ticks to moles to avian flu to increase their range. And kudzu no longer held in check by frost lines, um, which used to hold it in check in the north and moisture to the west. So pests are on the move. But in all, we have now 25,000 data sets of species on the move that are of more than a decade duration that are confirming what I just showed you. So how about the U.S.? Well, of course, the U.S. has gotten hotter on average over the last few decades, and some areas have seen bigger changes than others, as you can see. So this shows that the U.S. has warmed about 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit on average over the century, but the darkest areas are, of course, more than that. But kind of mitten with that warming, uh, we've had many more frost-free days. So between one week and two weeks on average here, nine more frost-free days, which you might to know. Um, but while 2014 was the warmest year in the world, 2012 was the warmest year in the United States. And you probably knew that, but parts of the Midwest were four to six degrees average warmer than they normally are. And we were in incredible drought, remember that? So 60% of the country had heat and drought, double whammy for our crops, and almost 5,000 records were broken that summer, and look how many of them are concentrated in our region. I said species are on the move. This is a map from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which shows how the plant growth regions, or the hardiness zones, have shifted in the last 10 years alone on the left. And Georgia can now grow tropical firebush. We've got dogwoods growing in Nebraska. And plants are shifting in response to changing temperature and precipitation uh, regimes. So they're moving latitudinally towards the poles and altitudinally up mountains. And I mentioned pests already in the Midwest. The ragweed season is two weeks longer. Um, and the pollen heads are 30% bigger. Poison ivy is also growing really well. And the compounds work many of us, I think all of us, are allergic to Yerushawal is becoming more potent. So the chart, the map on the right, shows the changes expected over the next 30 years. And so for those of you who think about this deeply, already we in Michigan have changed much of our area from what used to be a hardiness zone of five to six. And heading into the next century, we could be a hardiness zone of seven. And so those of us who are thinking about native, this is really a conundrum. Um, droughts are also getting more severe, especially in the West. And if you look at the chart on the bottom, you can see that perhaps we haven't seen anything yet, as you see the drought intensity getting much deeper as you head towards the end of the century. Um, perhaps you've seen this photo of Lake Mead, and you can see the bathtub right here, now, showing where the water levels used to be. The Lake Mead is now approaching the level of the intake um, pipes, and 40 million people depend on the water, this water supply. So these are all things I'm telling you that we've seen already. Another major observation that has already occurred is in how the rain is delivered. So increasingly, the rainfall you get is coming in heavy downpours. And so this is how it was summarized by region over the last several decades. And look at the Midwest and the Northeast. We have seen a very large increase in the amount of rain coming in these heaviest events. And in the future, even areas that are expected to get drier, like the Southwest, whatever rain they get, it's expected to come in these more um, drenching downpours. So erosive rains, not conducive to crops, and it makes people, protecting people, protecting crops, protecting ecosystems, um, much more difficult. And it's been leading to scenes like this. 
So if you look at how weather-related disasters have been changing over time, here's the picture for the U.S. So here I'm showing you the total number of billion-dollar events by state. I have to say, I think the gradation on the bottom is a little funky because it goes from like zero to 60. But just to help you calibrate, for the color that Michigan is, that's about $10 billion events over this 30-year period. Uh, for uh, the color Iowa is, that's about 20. For the color of Illinois, Missouri, and Kansas are, that's about $30 billion events. But look at Texas. You might not want to move there. They're already having more than $2 billion weather-related events a year. And this, of course, is not just happening in the U.S. So if you wanted to look at the global picture, the world picture, this is data from Munich Ray, an insurance company. And here you can see the total number of disasters have been increasing. So on these bars, ignore just the tiny little red part at the bottom, because those aren't weather related, they're geophysical, they're earthquakes, whatever. But everything above the red is related to weather and climate. Green is the storms, blue is the floods, yellow is the droughts and fires. And you can see that the total number hovered around 400 in the 80s, about 600 events in the 90s, and more like 800 events in recent decades. And for this past year, coming back to the United States again, there were, uh, here's where the billion dollar events were. And I think here in Michigan, we certainly remember the May severe weather and the August flooding. So the statistics of some of this are becoming much better. And I mentioned to you at the beginning that the possibility or the likelihood of having 13 of the last 15 years be the warmest on records was incredibly improbable, more than a trillion to one. But we're able to do some more interesting statistics with some of these things like heat now, too. And so um, if you look at summer temperatures historically, you would expect a bell curve. You'd expect that there'd be a normal distribution and even number of events in the middle, in white, and about a third of the events uh, warmer in red, and a third of the events cooler in blue. But by, by 1980, the distribution had shifted. By the next decade, it had moved more, and in the last decade, even further. And so now, extremely warm summers, which used to only cover 0.1% of the northern hemisphere, now cover 10%. And so as you can see, look how much is spreading into that three, four, five, sigma, five standard deviation area. So events that should be in an unchanged climate, one in a million are becoming much more common. And some of the power of these kinds of statistical analyses are really making the science irrefutable. Okay, so that's all happened today. What does the future portend? Well, business as usual. Um, is shown in the red band. And that's going to take us well past the warming of two degrees Celsius above pre industrial levels. And that two degrees is the guardrail that many governments and science bodies have called to avoid. And in fact, that is now built into the climate treaty. But instead, you'll be headed to something like four and a half degrees C, or almost nine degrees Fahrenheit above pre industrial levels. And that will take you to the roasted world that I showed you in the beginning. And on the right, you can see the temperature at which different kinds of effects become problematic. And so when things start to turn orange or red or more helpless purple. But what's quite startling is if you look at that, at the one degree above pre-industrial level where we are today, the first two bars, which are unique and threatened ecosystems and extreme events, are already showing red. They're already showing that we're in a high-risk area. We are already in, quote, the danger zone for those things. And I think that reflects some of the changes we're already seeing. Um, the changes that will occur, so change in temperature, change in precipitation, and change in sea level, will basically alter the ideal range where everything can live, where our crops and forests can grow, um, the timing, the quality, the availability of water, coastal integrity, uh, it's going to disrupt our ecosystems, our health will be degraded by heat waves and shifting pests, and um, energy consumption and reliability will change, and, and the flow of goods and services around the globe will be altered because we are so interconnected. And as we've seen, a failure to produce crops in one region can have um, repercussions around the globe. 
And, and I said right in the beginning, you know, one way to grasp the enormity of the change is to realize that by the end of the summer, by the end of the century, um, our summers will feel like we're going to see I believe the uh, states too. And I had said as Arkansas or Michigan. And, and you know, again, I think while it doesn't give you all the details, it certainly gives you a gestalt of a very different life. And let me talk a bit about sectors going forward. So agriculture, in the near term, that we obviously care about food productivity, water issues. In the near term, the decrease in the number of frost days that I mentioned, and the warmer temperatures, and carbon dioxide, which is a fertilizer, might actually increase yields in our region if extreme rainfall events don't get us. And over the long term, though, more negative than positive will occur as the increase in weeds, disease, pests that can now get maybe more than one generation in per, se per season um, will prevail. And the high temperatures at pollination will also have a big impact. So if you look at agriculture, um, and there are two really important crops here, corn and soybean belt, and as you can see on the maps on the bottom, we are the center. Um, the negatives will start outweighing the positives as temperatures start to increase. So by mid-century, if we are another four to five degrees warmer, we expect the um, corn yields will drop about a ton per hectare, and the soybeans about a half a ton per hectare. And again, think about nighttime temperatures, which can affect the general productivity and quality. We actually did see those nighttime effects in the heat of 2010 and 2012, which as I said was the warmest year for the US. Uh, moving on to water, hey, we are the land of water, and we know that quality, climate, and timing are key. I mean, so much of our character in this region is deeply marked by water. Um, the lakes, the Great Lakes, the Inland Lakes, the river. And if you think about cold water fish, such as brook trout, lake trout, whitefish, they're expected to decline dramatically. But warm water species, such as smallmouth bass and bluegill, will take their place. So, to those of you in the room who only fish for trout, you might have to go further north to find your favorite catch. Um, invasions of non-native species are certainly going to compound things. Uh, I mean, as you know, generally, invasives tend to be generalists, and they do well under a wide range of environmental conditions, while native species are often adapted to a narrower range of conditions, and they could lose out. Warmer water will likely lead to more algal blooms, extreme rainfall events can lead to combined sewer overflows. And if you look at the photo on the right, uh, that sailboat is actually in a sewerage plume from an extreme rainfall event and a sewer overflow. I'm sure that was not the family outing on the pristine community with nature that they had probably planned. Um, our ecosystems will be disrupted as the parts that swim and fly and crawl and are wind dispersed can't keep up with the pace of climate change and as they try to march towards the poles. Um, some estimates are that plant species would have to move up to 40 feet a day to keep up, which is at least four times the maximum seen in the fossil plant record. And our region has no mountains that they can try to climb up to, and we do have a few things in the way of migration routes such as the Great Lakes and croplands. As climate warms, um, people will probably notice the shifts in vegetation around them over their lifetime. We can probably expect that the prairies are going to move east, the hardwood forests move north, and the boreal forest really retreating far north. And just imagine it's 2100. Your children or your grandchildren are camping in the, the boundary waters minus the dense evergreen boreal forest that we so intimately connect with that area today. A very, very different place. Um, over the near term, again, the higher carbon dioxide levels will act as fertilizers and will increase productivity. But again, counteracting that will be elevated ozone levels, which goes faster under heat, more frequent droughts, forest fire hazards, and greater risks from insect pests such as the gypsy moth. Currently, some of these pests are controlled by our harsh winters, but they will most probably be able to survive the milder winters and reproduce more often. We have absolutely seen that happen already in the Rocky Mountains and in the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. And you know insects 
uh, determine their emergence by temperature, but songbirds time their migration by length of daylight. And so when the migrating songbirds come through the region, if their main food source has peaked early, they may not be there. And we are seeing some examples of this happening already. So the projections are, of course, that we will still have forests, but likely an expansion of oak hickory under both the low and high emission scenarios, the second and third maps, for the loss of the birch and beech and maple forest off into Canada with um, negative impacts for our fall foliage and our pancakes here, and we may need to say goodbye to this. So all in all, climate change will impact all the natural, engineered, and socioeconomic systems in the Midwest. All right, but what are ways forward? I think there's really three things that have to happen. Obviously, we have to aggressively mitigate or reduce greenhouse gas emissions to keep us away from that most of the world. But second, as I started, you need to vastly get on with adaptation, coping, preparing, a science and art that is way behind, or at least two decades behind, in, in our uh, robust and, and sustained thinking. And third, very importantly, while we're trying to adapt adaptively, we really need to learn by doing, and we have to share lessons learned along the way as the climate changes. So although this talk isn't about mitigation, I did want to show you just one slide on how big the task is to be on a low carbon pathway and keep the world from that roasted globe I showed you. So instead of the upper line, the upper trajectory, you want to be on that lower dotted line. And so how can you get from where you are to where you're going? You need these wedges to kind of lock off the emissions. And so globally, you need energy efficiency first and foremost, and that's the huge red, red wedge, using the energy we do use in our buildings, car, industry, power plants, etc., more efficiently. Um, but you also need the orange wedge, which is the next generation of renewables, and that's huge. It could be solar, wind, biofuels. Most models conclude that you need some nuclear to play a, continue to play a modest role, which I show. This is a model that doesn't show a whole lot of it, but that's the yellow wedge. The blue edge is carbon capture sequestration, or taking the carbon um, out of uh, the fossil fuel and somehow stuffing it underground, but that is energy intensive. But if you can figure a way to get rid of the CO2, you continue burning fossil fuels. And you see that's a huge wedge. But I particularly want you to notice the dark green wedge. That's storing more carbon in our landscapes, in our forests and a resource that we are very blessed with here now. The light green is going after other greenhouse gases like methane, nitrous oxide, and finally the last wedge is switching from coal to gas. I mean, but one thing that's apparent here is you need a portfolio of technologies. There's no silver bullet. It's not like you can get there just with renewables or just with nuclear or just with carbon capture sequestration. It is an enormous task, and the wedge that you see as the blue carbon capture sequestration wedge assumes we're going from storing about 100 million tons a now, uh, year now in kind of demonstration projects to 2 billion tons of carbon storage. Each of those wedges has an equally grand goal, so it is quite a technological feat. But the reason in particular that I wanted to show you this is because, as I said, the dark green, the forest, and the biofuel part of the orange wedge are very important. But we could do this really long, and here's just one example. So the slide on the right shows you if we were going to promote biofuels without valuing the carbon that exists in lands and forests or the biodiversity or protected areas, biofuels could consume quite a bit of land, and most likely that land would come from the unvalued carbon in managed forests and unmanaged forests and lands, which would be, of course, a disaster for protected areas and biodiversity. But if you seek to keep carbon in forests, grow biofuel sustainably, and count the carbon that's in those forests and value it, the bright green wedge on the left will be much smaller and less at the cost of natural areas. So it is very important that our landscapes be valued in any climate regime going forward, probably putting a price on carbon in that carbon held in our landscapes uh, so that it's not considered free. All right, this is one example of something we need to watch for. 
So um, adaptation, as I said, it's been too ignored and we need to get on with it. I think one of the most important areas is to seek to work to uh, um, adapt to multiple stresses of which climate change is one. So if we go counterclockwise <coughs> on this graphic, um, we see droughts, invasive species, floods, and restoring landscapes as very important roles in kind of dress, in trying to address multiple stresses and simultaneously build resilience or adaptive capacity. On the top right, we're looking at the Los Plateau of China, which is an area about the size of France, and it should be greening up now. Centuries of overgrazing, overuse, and lack of investments really resulted in that barren landscape you saw. But they restored the Los Plateau. It was costly. It took a tremendous amount of time, a lot of effort. But the investment in rehabilitating this region has now led to many multiple benefits. Increased household income, reduced frequency of floods and landslides, which are becoming a real problem in China, in some parts of China, and better environmental conditions, both locally and thousands of miles away. So it had multiple benefits, it tackled multiple stresses, and is a real win-win, the kind of things that we need to look for more of as we address climate change. And I would argue that to adapt, we're going to need to kind of make what I call robust decisions, rather than decisions that are optimal for today's climate. So, so you're picking a solution that has sort of a best outcome for a range of uncertain futures. I would also argue that anticipatory adaptation is preferable to reactive. And reactive, we see a lot of. We don't handle risk management now. Um, we don't handle disasters well. I mean, absolutely, I think we should not be building within one meter of sea level rise. We should not be planning for the 100-year drought or the 100-year flood of yore. Um, we should not over-assign water rights in arid areas. We need to do much more sophisticated watershed planning, and we need to prevent habitat fragmentation and encourage poor species migration corridors. So adaptation options might include, for example, um, picking the kind of wheat that has not the highest yield in the average climate, but which at least has decent yields across um, a variety of climates. We also certainly need to figure out what barriers can be removed to support wise management uh, or what incentives there can be, and certainly government has a role to play there. We might need to prioritize lands to preserve, because frankly not all biodiversity can persist, and we really need to think about native plants as those that can persist as we become zone six or perhaps even zone seven. Um, and we certainly need to conduct regular assessments that help us in our place characterize our vulnerability, what our problems are, what the multiple stresses are, and the possibilities for solutions that tackle several problems and certainly don't create new ones or exacerbate other ones. But adaptation is still really a very nascent um, art and science. And so if you read the compendium of actions in the adaptation chapter of the National Climate Assessment, you'll see, oops, sorry. Yes, we need you to help. If you read the compendium of adaptation actions that are in the National Climate Assessment, um, you'll see there's a great flurry of activity characterizing what's at risk and planning. Um, and just in those two parts of the circle. Not a whole lot in the rest of the circle, which is actually implementing actions, um, evaluating those actions that you took, revisiting those actions, and redesigning um, options that can do better. And so we really need to get on with those, and we also need to get on with sharing the lessons we're learning along the way so that communities responding to similar problems can learn from each other and can respond to a changing climate efficiently and effectively, because we're not going to have a lot of second chances. Now, I do think, fortunately, in the adaptation realm, some things are happening. So all the federal agencies, by executive order and the of the president, now have adaptation plans embedded into their sustainability plans. But that's kind of a top-down approach. Um, lots of municipalities are also planning, because they think they see things are changing, and they're trying to confront climate change. They see it as a necessity, so this is kind of a bottom-up. And we need to 
have the local and the federal efforts meet. And at least a good beginning of this is the new task force that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. They just put out their report, which has six themes. I'm just showing you theme three, which is on ecosystems. But they are really trying to say, we from the local communities, we mayor, tribal, gubernatorial leaders, are telling you what we need you to do to help us do our job better. In some cases, it's information. In some cases, it's incentives. In some cases, it's removing disincentives. But I think this is a, a really interesting effort to try to meet in the middle. And we are seeing from the local actions that they summarize um, that, can, that you can address climate change and have co-benefits. And here's some of the interesting examples. So Dubuque's Green Alley program and their expanded storm sewer to deal with flooding, and that's actually um, Dubuque's top picture there. Um, reducing the uh, ur urban heat island, um, Chicago using green roofs, New York using white roofs, uh, painting the roofs white. A lot of urban forestry and stormwater protection, or building deeper culverts as King, New Hampshire did to handle extreme rainfall increasing forest cover for all the good reasons that you get out of it, plus carbon, um, linking stormwater utility charges to impervious services that the Armour has done, reducing fire risk, preparing for sea level rise, and that's a big deal here, but we are requiring that climate change be incorporated, as Green Rapids has, into every city action. So these, I think, are, are really interesting, and you, as practitioners of the art and the science of natural resource stewardship, must enhance the set of best practices for managing under a changing climate. It's absolutely clear the past is no longer prologue and we can't plan for and manage our forests, our water supplies, our infrastructure, our ecosystems um, as if the climate of the last century will persist. It has already changed, it's going to change more, and we need to be proactive in natural resources and ecosystem services. I would be protecting natural resources and ecosystem services and honestly, most of the best practices that we are seeing accumulated in the literature so far are much more infrastructure-based than ecosystem-based. And so I think there's a lot of work for this community to do to bring to bear what are honestly best practices to cope with multiple stresses um, on ecological systems that build resilience and robustness going forward. So a lot is happening, much more than before, way less than is needed, and it's not too late to change our emissions path and reduce future climate change and its impact so that we can avoid that roasted world. Uh, the challenge is sustainable management of an ever-changing climate, but I wanted to end with that great conservationist, Teddy Roosevelt, because I think this quote is especially pertinent to us. He said, nine-tenths of wisdom is being right in time. We don't have any time to lose. So let's work together to continue to find solutions. So with that, thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Rosina. Um, yes, questions? Where in China was that? Um, uh, the Lowe's Peninsula, L-O-E-S-S. -S. So actually, I'm not sure I can tell you exactly how it was located, but it's certainly central. Because I'm going to China in April, and I have to give a talk on the place where I live. And so I wanted to address everything that this conference is about. So I can get you more information on exactly where that is on the map. Um, this is sort of a comment and see what you think. Uh, I've worked in a lot of wetlands that have been artificially drained for agriculture and I've spent enough time on farm fields uh, that are under um, industrial style agriculture and the, the tilth is so ruined and they're hardened and there's little carbon left in those. And it get, I get frustrated just walking out in those places. Um, and I can often see how the land is sunk in drained wetlands. And uh, so I think there's maybe a lot of opportunity there. And I'm just thinking back to the first talk we had this morning by Mark Shepard, and maybe how much carbon has been added to the soil 
in on his farm and maybe you know just kind of making that connection with maybe another um, large form of restoration that could occur. So thank you for that comment. You know, wetlands can store an amazing amount of carbon. And um, actually Jacqueline and I were just talking over lunch about you know, how the wetland banking systems that exist could perhaps be done in ways that allow more connectivity and that if, if I'm correct, I'm not certain um, that the wetlands that have been mitigated here in Michigan are monitored past a certain number of years. So as we're worried about, quote, persistence and changing hydrological regimes, uh, checking on that which we have put in place to do something and making sure it's still doing something is important. And of course, the, the soil is absolutely the biggest uh, reserve of carbon but it can also be very ephemeral. If you plow it, then it disappears. And um, I know for years, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has been trying to get better handles on, uh, on um, soil carbon and, and how to measure that. And it's certainly not built into the treaty yet, but it could be something coming down the road. I mean, very hard is that USDA has developed now these regional hubs to try to help specifically with thinking about climate change and land management, and um, they're pretty early. We'll have to see if there's going to be um, real strong benefit from that. But, but the, the, the mindset of the agencies has certainly been changed because they have to think about climate change in every activity. So I hope, and I agree with what you said. Thank you. I was just wondering. How does this affect the Ar Arctic Circle and all the other animals that live in the extremely cold places? So that, that's a really good question, Scotty, because um, the average temperature of the Earth doesn't tell you what's happening in the Arctic, and, and the effects of climate change are greatly amplified in the Arctic. So when you melt the ice, you're replacing the white surface that used to reflect sunlight, with a dark surface, like over in the water or land, and then that absorbs more sunlight. And so you get this feedback, which they call positive, but when they get the animals, it's negative because it's warming things up faster. And so the temperature increases in the Arctic have been about twice the average for the globe, and the projections going forward are pretty scary. Uh, certainly, whereas we are talking about maybe something like 8 degree Fahrenheit warming under business as usual by the end of the century, and I hope this will be here, um, that it would be about twice that much. So those ecosystems kind of have nowhere to go because, you know, we're saying the plants and animals are marching north. Well, those are the northmost animals and plants. And so you're exactly right that the Arctic ecosystems and the Arctic peoples are the most at risk. Their way of life is being changed very dramatically already. And I think there's probably nobody in this room who hasn't seen a picture of a polar bear swimming desperately at sea to find the ice that's been retreating. Um, already whole villages in Alaska have been moved because they used to have huge ice shelves that would protect them from the battering sea. And as the ice retreated, they literally fall into the ocean. So, so the Arctic peoples and the Arctic communities are absolutely most at risk. Um, the U.S. assumes the control of the Arctic Council this year, which has quite a bit to say um, about thinking in the Arctic. And um, my hope is that along with everything else that the president is trying to do on climate, there will be a strong uh, set of comments on it. There is an Arctic assessment. Uh, I think it's called, it's, it's acronym was ACIA, so it's probably Arctic Council Integrated Assessment, I'm not sure the I is. But if you want to look at that, the, the um, circumpolar countries, so eight, eight countries around the pole, got together to talk about the impact to their lives and their livelihoods would be, and, and it's a, a very distressing story. Um, and so you absolutely hit the most number of people, right? So the um, rate of ice melt in the floating ice in the sea ice in the Arctic is much faster than we thought. And since that's ice already on the water, when that melts, it's not raising sea level. But it is melting, and it's creating the dark ocean, and it's warming things up faster because dark absorbs more energy. 
Greenland, which is all ice sitting on land, that's melting really fast too. When that goes in the water, that does raise sea level rise. And both of those are melting faster than our physics models estimate. And so that really has the scientists concerned. Uh, a few years ago, the entire surface of Greenland was melting simultaneously. So that's why I was saying in the, in the Arctic, in the summer, there might, it might be completely ice free. And then you would get, create all kinds of uh, issues for everything from transportation, where you can uh, go through the Northwest and Northeast East Passage. But it would certainly amplify the warming. And so that's why some people who are really nervous that we're not going to be able to stop this global warming are actually thinking about, well, if we could put reflective particles in the atmosphere and put them over the big ice sheets at the right time, we could keep them from melting, um, which is kind of interesting. It's called geoengineering. But you know, you saw in Russia during the Olympics when they could hardly keep the snow frozen. They were actually sort of trying to do that, reflect the incoming sunlight, wrap the wrap the you know, mountains in, in snow. But doing it on a scale to have a big a big enough difference to change the planet is is uh, very controversial and very hard. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. The Arctic's in trouble. <laughs> Uh, I have the exact same question. I went to Alaska this October. I went to the Alaska Sea Life Center. And what I found there were these three curriculums on DVD called Meltdown, Watch and Wall, Resistance and Southern Exposure. But they answer some of the questions that I think are at least give more insight into what you're talking about. So I'd like to make sure that you get a copy of these. We'll make a copy um, these go ahead and give it to them. We'll look at it for now anyway. Great. I'll give it to them to copy it. But um, I had the exact same question and went to Alaska to try to find some answers. Thanks. And I had a picture I almost showed where some of the permafrost thawing is, you know, it's doing lots of things to cities, as I mentioned, but it is also collapsing yeah. forests. Well, they're drunk trees. Now. Drunken trees is what they call them. And yeah, because they look like they're. You saw them. I've been given this. I'm supposed to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I have the dear soaked Kleenex to prove it. I've been sitting here weeping, not because I'm so surprised at how bad it is. I'm not a bit surprised. It's just because I'm so surprised at how good it is that so many minds are being changed and so many people who finally see how bad it is are going to make changes and going to work together. And yes, we've done some things we can never fix. You know, when the settlers came to North America, they did things we'll never be able to fix. But just in time, people like Teddy Roosevelt said, hey, wait a minute, we can't keep doing that. We're going to do it different. And I'm just crying because we're going to do it different. transition. So um, my question for you, thank you for presenting here for us, um, is as uh, Great Lakes residents and stewards of currently under this climate, um, the world